Alright, uh, the last part with Jacob Applebaum and uh, now he's off to, uh, no, he's about to answer some questions. We were actually going to bounce. In the bouncy castle? Yeah, but uh, the, the queue is too long now. Uh, I was already there once, it was pretty good. <laughs> you, you looked happy. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, yeah. Anyway, so now off to the questions. Um, Zaya. <laughs> nice, uh, nice screen there, that yeah. was good. Uh, we're going to show that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Zaya wants to know, does the NSA try to hack into Tor servers? Is it true that NSA holds on to encrypted info for longer than regular communi communications? I mean, I'm, it's a good question, right? I think that the NSA does a lot of offensive hacking, and we know that from Stuxnet, for example. And Stuxnet is where they actually interfered with physical processes in the real world using electronic techniques, so using actual computer hacking techniques, signals, uh, intelligence plus electronic warfare, so to speak. Some of that stuff is ages old. Some of it is brand new variations on these old age things. Um, do they monitor the Tor network? I wouldn't be surprised if they monitor the Tor network. An interesting question is, do you think you are better or worse given total surveillance of the internet? I would prefer to have a thing where if at best they could do was trace it back to Tor, Whereas my home internet connection is probably monitored, as is, I would imagine, everyone's. Therefore, the question is, is it better to have everything you do directly tied to everything in your name? Or is it better to have it tied, in some cases, to Tor, potentially? And I would suspect that the answer is that for most things, it's better to have it tied to Tor. Do they hack Tor servers? I don't know. I mean, it seems to suggest that they would be most interested, not in hacking Tor, but in monitoring it. So this is, I, I feel like, a, a pretty reasonable trade-off that we have to make as individuals, which is, are we better off with some privacy, even though it's not perfect, versus no privacy? So, but, but, I think but, we want more privacy, even though it may be imperfect. We haven't yet fully understood the edges of that yet, and I think in the future it might be possible to understand it further, and I hope we learn a lot more. Okay, Zai also wants to know, is China better at surveillance or is the U.S.? Like, for example, are Americans better off using sh Chinese social media than, say, Facebook? I mean, it's two really awful choices there, you know? So I don't, I'm not really a big fan of um, framing it in a nationalist debate. The question is whether or not we want the social benefits of Facebook and we're going to acknowledge the positive things. I like the phrase Stasi book myself. I mean, I don't actually think it's very socially healthy to report on your friends all the time and to take photos and upload them and to give it to the authorities or potentially to give it to the authorities. I think that's a really terrible, awful, awful thing to do. And so I don't participate in that. But that's like the kill your television slogan of the 80s and 90s. You know, it, everybody's doing it. So there's no possible way that you can really opt out of it. This is network effect. Are the Chinese better at surveillance? Well, I'll tell you, the Chinese are not better at keeping their surveillance a secret. That's for sure. They, they're they well known for it. But the joke is that their surveillance is hardly on par with what Edward Snowden has revealed. So which one is better? I mean, they're both awful, right? They're both awful and they both have different kinds of awful consequences. Surveillance from Americans results in drone strikes in some cases. Surveillance from the Chinese might result in a visit from the organ harvesting van. Who knows, right? I mean... I suppose it's just a mobile death van. They probably harvest the organs elsewhere. But both of those are really terrible. And I actually would like to see a world where neither of those things is the case. Exactly. Um, and just one more. A judge just granted Chevron access to the identities and IPs of activists that protest them. Will we see more of this in the future? Of course. This is a retroactive data policing, right? I mean, hello. So, of course, we're going to see more of it, right? When the German politi uh, politicians talk about, um, you know, data retention, what are they talking about? They're talking about making it so that corporations can, in fact, go into that set of data and to take information out of it. So what is it that they're really talking about? They're talking about retroactive policing. They're talking about building um, a slightly more open version of the NSA's total surveillance system. And they're doing it by force. And retroactive policing, I think, is not reasonable it's really scary stuff and it you know the data trail you leave behind and i've often said this the data trail you leave behind tells a story about you which is not necessarily true so we're going to see more of it and we shouldn't have seen it happen at all with chevron but it's kind of inevitable when that data is being collected that someone will want to sift through it 
Uh, in the future, what will state surveillance mean for the Internet of Things? Like, for example, will doors l literally be closed to people? Well, I think state surveillance can't be viewed in, um, you know, in a vacuum, so to speak, right? So we have to consider that surveillance is only one component of a control society. And that's what we see. We see a control society being born. Right? So yes, doors will literally be closed. We already see that now in that if you wish to travel somewhere and you have a credit card and your credit card is declined, you can't travel. Right? This is just the beginning of it though because pretend you want to go somewhere and you want to be left alone. If your phone can be turned into a listening device, if the camera can be turned on, if its location can be identified, and all of those things are true, what have you done? Right? You have essentially had a policeman in your pocket the whole time. You just didn't know when it became a policeman against you. Uh, Rico wants to know, uh, how can he explain to his parents that online surveillance is uh, a bad thing? Like, like, in a, in, in, like in a short version. Get them first to understand that online surveillance is not limited to the Internet. And then secondarily to ask them if they would feel that it was all right to have surveillance of the totality of their life. If they are, of course, not happy with total surveillance of them, then that would be pretty obvious to connect at that point. But it's difficult because people believe, unfortunately, that there is a disconnection between the Internet and the rest of the world. But the reality is that your credit card, it, those transactions, they go over the Internet. Your phone, they go over the Internet. Or the telecommunications networks. That's really, that is what we're talking about. It's all things that connect to each other that are not even directly next to each other. But even those things that are directly next to each other, those things pass through these surveillance systems. And they're combined with physical surveillance. They're combined with other intelligence ga gathering operations. And they're combined with actionable results that are specifically targeting based on surveillance data. So there's a connection between drone strikes and wars and surveillance, right? And there's not just like an indirect connection. There's a direct connection. So the way to convince people that this is important, especially one's parents, is to show them the things that they cared about in the past and to show them that this is the next version of it. Only this one is more serious and in some cases it's hard to imagine how we might end it. Um, how do you see the future of big data? Is it, is it an opportunity or simply a risk for all of us? I see that there's good that can come from consensual amounts of data, large data. So if you consent willingly in, in an informed way, if you can be informed, then there's good things that can come from that. So there's the difference between sort of like myware and spyware. So like when people, you know, measure their own calories, when they measure their own intake and they share that stuff freely, or when they sequence their own genetic profile or something like this, that's a choice you make. When someone else makes it about you, it's, it's, that's when it is a dangerous thing. So what is the future of big data? The future of big data is the past. You know, look at the programs that we've seen with Deutsche Homag in the 20th century. That was the first big data program that ever existed, right? The census data of Germany, and where did that lead? Where did that lead for Holland? Where did it lead for France? The future of big data is more of that when awful people have access to it. So we must keep in mind that when the CIA is, or the NSA or the FBI are able to get Facebook data and they use that in drone strikes, the future of big data is the ability to pull things out where people think they know what they're doing and then to do things unilaterally that cannot be appealed, in some cases very terribly so. It's not only that. There are, there are good things that come from it, too. But it isn't clear to me that without consent it's something that is a reasonable thing. And so we have to be very careful by looking at history. And there's a book by Edwin Black called IBM and the Holocaust, and I know it's a tired thing for people to bring up the Holocaust, but this book tells us what happens when corporations and people in those corporations do not think about what they are doing in a way that is high-minded with goals, when only seeking profit, for example, in the case of IBM, they look the other way about terrible things and also about what the result is with big data in the hands of not-so-great people. Um, some more questions and uh, let's try to stick to short answers. Uh, do you think that it's principally compatible with constitutionality when a state has a secret service? Well, it depends. For example, in India, the Intelligence Bureau is a product of colonialism and that colonialist holdover has nothing to do with acts of parliament. So in that case, no. 
but there are places where the intelligence services are potentially a product of democracy. In that case, it might be yes. And it seems like, for example, the New Zealand intelligence service is like the really friendly, incredible Kiwi version of the NSA. And that's not to say that it's great, but like by comparison, in terms of parliament action, in terms of legal recourse, in terms of actual control, they are seemingly like really great by comparison to the lawless CIA. But in general, I think in democratic societies, we need to have information about what's happening and there's nothing wrong with that. But where it is wrong is where it is not democratic, where it is not accountable, where it is not transparent. And I mean mandatory transparency after a reasonable amount of years so that people who are lied to have recourse and people who are told the truth can have faith and can trust it. So I think it depends. But probably intelligence agencies as we know them today are not compatible with democracy. And in fact, what we see is that democracy is being completely undermined by these intelligence agencies. Uh, what do you think of the term digital self-defense and its implications? I don't like the idea of using violence like cyber war as a metaphor. And I think when people talk about cyber war, we should really be talking about peace building. And I think when we talk about self-defense, we should try to consider what we really mean is not just self-defense like we wouldn't say safe sex is digital self-defense or physical <laughs> self-defense there's something else it's like you know it's like a health precaution for example or it is a regional safety precaution to wear a seat belt right there there are non-violent ways to consider this and we should consider the non-violent analogies rather than only talking about it in terms of a struggle or a war because that leads to a really bad mindset i think Uh, Miriam Seifert uh, wants to know from you, is he scared to return to the US after his stay in Germany and with all, all these revelations and the media coverage of his activities, what will happen when uh, he returns to the US? What does he expect? What's going to happen at the border? How long does he plan to stay in Germany? Yeah. <laughs> who, do you, yeah who do you work for, Miriam? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I... BND, I, I guess. <laughs> Wait, that's not you guys? Mm, not yet. Oh, boy. <laughs> um... You know, I don't fear that which is certain. Um, why does Edward Snowden meet with Human Rights Watch? Yeah, I asked myself this question, I suppose. But the reason is because even, even groups, I would imagine, you know, without knowing anything about why he did this, I would imagine that it's because Human Rights Watch, even though they have extremely questionable double standards at times, um, they do actually seem to care quite a lot about human rights and they do make very good observations about human rights abuses and they do really have important things to say on these topics. But I don't know about Snowden in particular. I, I personally like a lot of the Human Rights Watch people that I've met and I have a lot of respect for them, but I think they've done a real disservice to Bradley Manning in particular and I think that that's really disgusting and that comes from the fact that they don't want to rattle the you know, let's say the cage that they're in with the United States. And that is really sad. Hello. Uh, Ulrike Bauer wants to know, considering the cases of Snowden, Manning, but also Michael Hastings and Barrett Brown, is Obama at war with journalism? How can investigative journalism be secured in the U.S.? Well, I mean, that's the that's a great question. I mean, isn't the answer quite obvious when, you know, Glenn Greenwald is in Brazil uh, and other people are outside of the United States? The way that it is secured is with mutual aid and solidarity from other reasonable people around the world so that we might actually be able to have investigative journalism in the United States, again, without serious fear. I mean, I came to Germany because I felt safer here as a tourist, even on a tourist really? visa, than I would writing and working on these topics as an American citizen in America. So you couldn't be uh, bouncing as safely over there than here? Well, you know, there's a big difference between the feeling that I have in Berlin than the feeling that I have at home in Seattle or in San Francisco. And it's sad, actually. I think, I don't know about Hastings' death. I don't really understand the situation there. I don't know the result. But Baird Brown is very clear, right? Baird Brown is a guy who basically is an incredible investigative journalism person who has been targeted by the FBI and who is facing ridiculously long you know, statutory, statutory maximum sentences. And even if he gets a single day, that's too much. He has not committed any crime. And the really crazy part is that he's already been in jail for an extremely long period of time. I mean, he is absolutely an example of how political police like the FBI do terrible things to people that dare ask questions about those political police or their allies or the surveillance state that serves them. Uh, Hans wants to know, why is the Patriot Act not patriotic? What, what's a Patriot? <laughs> it's, 
It's the weirdest question yet. I mean, wh why is the Patriot Act not... Uh, Hans, do you want to uh, defend, your, uh, defend your question? <laughs> why is the Patriot Act not patriotic? Because it enables the government of the United States to do terrible things that are just simply unconstitutional. Therefore, if they are unconstitutional actions, they, by their very definition, are not patriotic. But what is a patriot? I mean, this is a question which I think is sort of disgusting, and it's like, what is a nationalist, right? I mean, I suppose that if I were to dignify that with a response, sorry, Hans, I would say <laughs> uh, I, that, uh, you know, a patriot is someone who recognizes that a country and its people is more important than a government and its laws especially when they seek to undermine constitutional values. This is why I respect Edward Snowden so much. Here is a person who may have violated laws of the country, but he did it in service of the people. And he didn't do it in service of a flag. He did it in service of human beings that live in this land. But actually, he also did it in service of the whole planet, all of the innocent people of the entire planet. So what is a patriot? A patriot is a person who believes in humanity over regulations and rules and laws that are not just. That's what a patriot is. And it must transcend the notion of nationality in the modern world, I think, to be a real patriot. And yeah, the final ones. Uh, what do you think about a world with no secrets and a complete transparent society? I mean, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, it's like saying, what do you think of a post-privacy world? We're not post-privilege. We'll never be post-privacy in a meaningful, safe way. And, you know, transparency if institutions and personal privacy is not contradictory. In fact, it is how we have traditionally had liberty in the world. When we have transparency of institutions, it allows us to have accountability, it allows us to have redress, it allows us to have facts to understand these things, and it gives us the, the correct asymmetric power relationship with power itself, right? And when we have personal privacy, that allows us to have dignity and to have agency. So what do I think of a complete surveillance state where everyone is surveilled all the time? I think that that is a recipe for injustice because the power dynamic will not disappear when privacy disappears. Mark Etzel wants to know, everyone is talking about the US and UK surveillance programs, which they use against their European partners. Is he aware of any activities from European countries against the US or between European partners? Does he, does he or no one have any information about that? I mean, I know what I read in Der Spiegel. Okay. Is there any bigger response about PRISM and, uh, and all that stuff in the U.S.? And why, and why not? I think, there's a big, I think there's a big response about it, but I think that the media in the United States is not particularly thoughtful and often believes directly whatever the government says. So the government says, oh, we're not breaking the law, and then they report it. And it's, of course, complete nonsense, and Snowden's leaks, the way they were timed and the way they have been timed is really impressive because someone will say, oh, that didn't happen. And then the leak will come out that proves that they just lied to everyone, like they personally lied to everyone. And then it happens again and again and again. And so there is a big deal about that, and there is a lot of anger in the United States about it. But Germany is really leading the forefront of this debate across the whole planet. And I think that's directly tied to German history and education about that history and about perspective. Like when you say you're from the East and you experience the Stasi and you tell me, you know, that that's really scary stuff to see repeated, basically, that to me is like that is one of the worst things I can imagine anyone saying anywhere. And very few people can say that other than the Germans right now. I think, especially credibly in the Americans' eyes. When Germans, who are mocked in America about having to show papers and so on, um, when those things occur in American media, a lot of critics in America kind of don't have a lot to say anymore because they used to mock Germany for not being free. But who is not free? When you go to a country and someone requests your papers? Or a country in which there is the illusion of choice, where they don't need to request your papers because they already have them. And when a German makes this observation, especially about the Stasi, or especially about any of this privacy stuff, it really smacks differently than when an American person says it. Like, oh, you know, you have so much white privilege in America, you don't know what suffering is. But when someone who grew up under the Stasi says, hey, what the hell is wrong with you, America? <laughs> that, uh, that, that drives home a totally different point. And it actually silences people, especially those who have had friends before the Venda, right? Who lived in, you know, in the GDR. And that is very powerful. So. It is a big debate, and Germany can even help expand that debate quite a, a great amount, I think. So I hope that it will continue. I agree. And Juliane Schreiber wants to know, given that the majority of the people worldwide is against the method of NSA, is it possible to form a worldwide alliance against the surveillance? That's the final question. 
Sure. I mean, run, run a Tor relay, help us to build privacy systems, help us to normalize the idea that to unsafely and unsecurely communicate on the internet is something that is not acceptable. You know, help us to build free and open source software that we can verify, that we can understand, help us to outlaw these types of things, but also to make sure that when outlaws break the law, that the return on their investment is very little. We have to actually also have truth and reconciliation. So it starts now. There's a German election coming. I don't know anything about German politics, but I suspect the German people do. And they should look to see who is up for election and ask them these hard questions. And the, the people that reject German sovereignty, that your individual privacy, those people are probably people you don't want. All right. Um, I do think you overestimate the German people. But uh, no, no, I just uh, I'm putting a lot on your shoulders, so don't fuck it up. Okay, I'll try. Uh, th thanks, J Jacob Elbelmore, for uh, to talking in, uh, in a hopefully young and naive style uh, about this whole mess. Yeah. And, uh, thanks for having me. See you again soon. Hope so.